All right, so spyware is stuff that, uh, as you expect from the name, it infects your machine and then steals secrets from you. It records what you're doing. The most common type is legal, and this is how Google makes all their money, by spying on you. Google puts cookies on your machine. There's a technique called third-party cookies that was invented by a company called DoubleClick, and it was so successful that they managed to make enough money to make it Google interested, and Google bought them and incorporated it into their products. So the fact is, every time you go to any website on your machine, Google puts about a dozen cookies and other tr marks on your machine to record who you are, and they follow everything you do. They know every website you go to, every click you make, whether you're using their browser or not. And if you try to delete the cookies, you can't because they have a highly trained team of professionals coming up with more and more sneaky ways to hide marks on your machine. And even if you delete them all, they're tracking your IP address and other things so that um, it's almost impossible to escape their tracking. And this is all legal and this is why the internet is free. Uh, Microsoft and other companies that do not depend on advertising occasionally try to pass laws against spyware. And if they were to succeed in outlawing spyware, the internet would not be free anymore. They would have to charge you five cents for every email and one penny to view every page. They gotta pay for it somehow, and this is how they're paying for it. And they did it by essentially completely crushing the print advertising market and most of the television advertising market and moving it all to Google advertising, which is far better than anything else. Advertising used to work entirely by intuition. You would pay models to come dance and splash around in a fountain and talk about how great cigarettes were for you. And you would make this really <coughs> polished, beautiful ad and play it on TV. And there was a belief that if you made the colors more brilliant and the people more beautiful, more people would smoke cigarettes. But nobody really knew if that was working. But Google does it all with science. You pay for it. Uh, your ad to appear when a certain word is used in a Google search, you know exactly how many people saw that this week, how many people clicked on it this week, how many people purchased your product as a result. So it's now scientific. This ad produced this much profit. And you can forget about all this intuition that made us think that that beautiful ad is selling more stuff. We now know exactly how much this ad sold and how much that ad sold. And that was a huge hit. So that's the legal side of it. The illegal side is people that just steal things like your passwords and credit card numbers, and Google doesn't do that because they want to stay um, legal. And the head of Google said, we go right up to the edge of the creepy line, but we stop before it gets creepy. Now, some people already feel pretty creeped out, but they do stop before it's blatantly illegal. Um, one of the San Francisco companies that doesn't is Conduit. Conduit writes one of the nastiest browser hijackers. I had a student that worked for Conduit. And Conduit is malware, it infects your machine, hijacks your home page, hijacks your search engine, and it's almost impossible to remove. And um, he said, I was working there, and they said, well, how about we write a browser toolbar? And the browser toolbar is gonna steal everything you type in the browser. He said, now we want you to write an SSH, man in, uh, SSL man in the middle attack that will steal data off the encrypted network connection by stealing a key off the machine. He said, you know, I think I've had enough of this, I'm gonna get another job. <laughs> There's a limit to how evil I'm willing to be just for a paycheck. But um, so that stuff is probably illegal, but like many of these things, they, they managed to get a team of lawyers and somehow managed to stay legal for a while. Um, anyway, it'll often pop up boxes telling you you have done something, your machine has been detected going to porn sites or something, and then you have things to click. And usually whichever one you click, they interpret it as yes and install junk on your machine. Um, often even clicking the X, they interpret that as say yes. Uh, Microsoft got a lot of criticism with Windows 10 when they did this. Microsoft wanted everybody to update to Windows 10 for some reason that I do not know. And so they forced everyone to download Windows 10, whether you like it or not. Your Windows 7 machine would download three gigabytes of Windows 10 and then pop up boxes saying, time to install Windows 10. And in the last month of the ad, it actually popped up a box, do you want to install Windows 10 or not? And whether you said yes or no, it just installed Windows 10. <laughs> and, and people complain and say, man, you know, Microsoft is supposed to be a legitimate software company. You're not supposed to be doing stuff like this. But people, waver on the edge and occasionally they dip down into the bad side for a while. Um, so adware is where ads pop up on your screen in a diff and, and it may or may not be spying on you also. Um, now some adware is actually delivered. There's a company called Net Zero that would give you free internet if you let ads pop up on your screen. And some people went for that a long time ago back in the days of dial-up. Most of the time adware is now uh, just purely malicious and nobody wants it. Uh, but usually the trick is so people say you agreed to this stuff. The most category, common category of malware is PUPs, potentially unwanted programs, where technically 
there were some long terms of service. Like you go to some place to play a game or see a video, and it says before you play this video, you have to install this player, and the player has this terms of service that 10 pages is long, and somewhere in there it says, I agree to have my browser homepage changed and my search engine changed and ads pop up all over the screen and everything I do be sent back to the home company. And they say, you agreed to that, you wanted that. It's legal. Anyway, um, so it's very hard to protect against these malware attacks. Uh, there's not much you can do, it helps to have pop-up blocked on your browser and uh, antivirus and such. The most important thing you can do is update your operating system and the software you use. That is your most powerful defense, but it's not terribly uh, powerful. <laughs> and uh, a lot of people like to educate users so they know what the latest campaigns are. Um, I think the um, latest ransomware has motivated a lot of people to learn how to use backups. And everybody does need to learn to use backups. In my experience, nobody uses backups until they've lost important stuff two or three times, and then they've been hurt enough that they learn it really is worth the bother of backing up your stuff. I lost my thesis six times, had to what's rewrite it from scratch. What's the best way to back up your stuff? What's that? What's the best way to back up your stuff? It's a, or that's a very good question, and uh, you they all have their advantages. Um, things like Dropbox and Box will automatically synchronize across many machines which is very convenient. However, if you get infected with CryptoLocker, it will encrypt all of it. And it'll encrypt all the copies in the other machines too. Um, and that happened to a lot of people. Like they have, they have their local cloud, they have their VMs in the cloud and their things in the cloud. When an administrator account or someone gets infected, it then infects all the cloud stuff and all the cloud backups. So that's an issue. A Dropbox is in fact pretty good that way because Dropbox backs up all your stuff and on the website, it stores the last 30 days of old versions of your stuff. So you could get the old version even if the new version has been encrypted. By the way, this is also great for law enforcement with a search warrant. They can find out what all your files are and what they were 30 days ago before you deleted all the stuff you're trying to lie about. But that's the easy one. Of course, one problem with cloud backup is it's based on your internet connection. One of my friends uses, um, I think Iron Mountain. Uh, I forget, no, it's, uh, there's another one that backs up the entire machine on the cloud. So he bought a new machine and downloaded it all and it took two weeks. To, to download it off the new machine. So that's a limitation. If you have a lot of stuff to back up, you pretty much have to get a movable hard drive or something. But you have to find some technique that works for you. Um, my sister writes novels, I got her a USB stick. She wore it as like a necklace and packed a copy on that everywhere because she kept getting her machine infected and losing all her stuff. Um, you have to find some system. There has to be some second copy of your stuff somewhere or you will be sorry. Even aside from malware, sooner or later your hardware will break and your stuff will all be gone and then you'll regret not taking the time to find some backup solution. I like the cloud. I, all, everything that matters to me is on my web page. So that's on a cloud service that I, that's completely separate from my stuff. Um, and I also have Box and Dropbox synchronizing stuff on many machines. So there's a lot of copies of all my stuff all over the place. Another thing to be aware of is if you have anything sensitive in there, like the grades, that's encrypted. And it better be because copies of it are flying all over the place. It's not that unlikely at all that some student or somebody could get to one of my machines that has a copy of the gradebook on it. And if they did, it would be encrypted. So that would be another layer of defense to limit them hacking in. If you do find some way to hack in and change your grades, let me know, it'd be worth extra credit. Anyway, um, so, so you'll see these, uh, your, yeah. How safe are clouds? How safe what? How safe are clouds? Clouds? A lot of people are very worried about security of clouds. Um, no, there's no simple answer. Uh, Dropbox, for example, has, um, a, that means everything you put in your Dropbox is put on their server and they have made some really serious security errors. Like uh, for a period of five hours, about three years ago, they forgot to enforce all passwords entirely. So everybody could get in everybody's box. But I don't think anybody much noticed and did it, but that's the kind of thing that could make you nervous. And another thing is, if you are at a company and you have something like, say, healthcare data, and you put it on an Amazon virtual machine, then you really have to answer a simple question. How many copies of that data are there and where are they? And if you put it in a cloud service, you don't know. You don't even know what country they're in. Microsoft, um, their cloud, Azure, they specifically warn you, if you put anything on Azure, we are replicating across our vast data center and we don't even know how many copies there are and there's no reason to even know what country they're in. So you should be aware of that. And so this means as everyone moves to the cloud, people wonder about this. And if you want to be, have some control, you either have to pay more. Amazon has a higher price service for health compliance where they do answer these questions, where they limit where it goes and you know where it is 
so you can use it with health data. And the other thing you can do is encrypt it before you send it to the cloud. And then it doesn't really matter what they do with it because you have the key. But that's a very good question, and that's what's been holding everyone back for cloud deployment. Everyone's been trying to, this college used to have local email running on servers on campus with a student email, and they ran it so badly that it crashed frequently and they lost all the email, the drive got full. And I was a strong advocate for moving to Gmail. And a lot of people said, that's going to expose all our students to Google spying on their email. And I said, yeah, but they'll actually have email for them, and I'd rather have availability at sacrifice of privacy. And Google does read all your email, and they use it to target ads. So it is absolutely true that when you put your data on some cloud server, there is now somebody else that has your data, and they are going to be using it for their own purposes, and they're going to be handing it off to the government with court orders and not telling you. They have no choice at all about that now. I think one of the cloud services last week just finally got able to release the national security letters. Ever since the Patriot Act, the government can come to them and demand that they hand over the data about you and that they don't tell anybody or they will go to jail. So you'll never know they did it. This is why some people, like Hillary, prefer to run their own email server so that this will not happen. Nobody can take it without you knowing about it. But then you're responsible for all the security of that server and that turned out to be a big disaster. If you're a public figure in a government office, there are requirements to archive everything you do because it's government property. And now if you run it on your private server, you have that problem. So nothing simple. Cloud services are convenient, and I use them for that reason. But it absolutely means that somebody else has access to all your stuff. Anyway, um, so people, you educate your users about these issues, just the kind of thing they should know. Your users should understand why you don't want them plugging in random USB sticks you find lying on the ground. and whether it's okay to put the company email on their iPhone or not, and that sort of thing. Um, and your antivirus updates automatically, so that's usually not a problem. Um, if you don't update it, it's essentially useless. There are other things like adware blockers, SpyBot and AdAware and such. Um, then there's firewalls of various levels, um, hardware firewalls on the edge of the network to protect the whole network, and then software firewalls like the Windows firewall running on the workstation to protect you from your neighbors. Uh, Usually people use both of those, uh, which is called defense in depth. You have layers of defense, so even if some threat gets through one defense, there's another defense behind it that might limit the harm. And then most companies get intrusion detection systems. People don't usually run them at home, but an intrusion detection system is like antivirus for the network that scans all the network traffic coming in and blocks known network attacks. You can also put it on a server, and then it's a host-based intrusion detection system, and it can use not only the network traffic, but the server logs to detect attacks in progress and block them. Uh, one simple one, very powerful, is Tripwire. Tripwire will just store, um, it's, uh, it has a Windows version and a Linux version. The Linux version is the one I use all the time. It will store a record of the MD5 hash of every file on your machine in the folders you select, and if any of them change, it will tell you. Somebody changed this file, so if any kind of software is being installed, it will warn you. If you weren't installing it, that's somebody else messing with the machine, and that's very good. Uh, one big issue is people that spread misinformation. It is easy to get people scared, um, and then they will stupidly purchase expensive, useless products. And this is a perfectly valid business model. I mean, uh, it's a common business model, it's not a legal one. Uh, you will lose your CISSP certification, other certifications for this. It's explicitly mentioned as one of the cardinal sins that they will yank your certification for is lying to people to make them scared so they will buy broken junk. Uh, this happened to the college. Uh, a couple of years ago, in the headline of the Chronicle and all the newspapers around the world said City College had the worst virus outbreak ever heard at a college. 10,000 machines all infected for 10 years, stealing all the student data, and all of us were too stupid to do anything about it. The problem is, this never happened. It was completely fake. It was um, a crooked official at the college, our chief uh, technology officer, hired a crooked contractor to come in and pretend to find these viruses so he could be a hero and claim to clean them off. And it took a gang of us about a year or two to get him fired. Um, and that, that was the enterprise level of the fake antivirus. Um, it, and it was never fixed in any of the media. This is one thing, if you, when I was young, I used to believe what I read in the news and, and saw on TV. And then I got involved in political actions and things where I, I was involved in a lot of things that did hit the paper and I learned Things have not changed much since the days of Thucydides in ancient Greece, where he would just go and talk to somebody who said he was there 10 years ago and write down what he said and call that the news. It's, it's amazing how little connection there is between news and fact. And the one thing I'll mention here is this is still the documented truth. If you look at um, 
None of this was ever retracted. I gave talks at DEF CON, I wrote an article. None of these, this went around the world. This is probably in textbooks as an example of a virus infection by now because none of it was ever retracted by any of these news media. They just say anything that will sell the paper today and they couldn't care less if tomorrow it's all proven wrong. It's a thing to be aware of. Anyway, so uh, attacks are people that try to do some kind of harm to you through your computer network and security is this, again, sort of vague idea where you have somehow lowered the amount of attacks down to a level that you can get the job done. I mean, there's no perfect safety or perfect security but there is a state of security when people are secure enough that they can get through the day. Like in San Francisco, you walk down the street, get to your car, and pretty much people don't shoot you and mug you. It's not like it never happens, but it's down to a low enough level that you can live your life reasonably without being terribly inconvenienced by it, and that's what you call a state of security. Um, computer security is, of course, the networks being clean enough and the computers being clean enough that you can get your job done, and computer crime is the fastest kind of crime. Uh, 2011 or 2012, I think, was the first year when the total amount of money stolen with online bank robbery exceeded the amount of money stolen with face-to-face -face bank robbery. And I see this as a great thing. The point is, if, if they steal your money on the internet, it's better for everybody. It's better for the criminal. It's better for the victims. It's better for the bystanders. You don't have people driving cars, getting shot, shooting security guards, holding people at gunpoint in banks. We don't need that, neither do the criminals. It's much more sanitary to do it online, and that's where it's going. Anyway, so um, uh, denial of service attacks are attacks that don't steal anything, they just freeze a network, so you can't get any work done, or a server. Um, this is a pretty serious crime. Uh, you can actually get yours in jail for the really old-fashioned attack. There's a pretty old-fashioned uh, attack against a fax machine. You take three sheets of paper and tape them together, and then start sending a fax so it goes around and around and around and it makes an endless chain of faxes at the other end, you can actually get years in prison for doing that, tying up the phone line and the fax machine. And computer attacks are just various versions of the same thing where you send some flood of useless traffic that ties up the server so people can't get their work done. Uh, this is done all the time, very commonly by players of online games. They'll DOS the opponent to win the game. Um, it is very common that people hire people that have botnets to DOS their competitors in business, like one shoe store will DOS the other shoe store so all the traffic comes to me over the weekend. Um, and it's also commonly done for extortion, where they will DOS you for a few hours and then say, all right, I want 40,000 bucks or I'm going to keep doing that every weekend from now on. That's just the old-fashioned protection money stuff, and it works. A lot of people pay up. Uh, typically, just like ransomware, uh, it would be far more expensive uh, for DOS attacks to protect yourself, you actually have to pay for a, a DOS protection service or upgrade your systems to be much more powerful and typically paying the ransom is cheaper. Although, I've mentioned probably before, Cloudflare is a free service that will protect every website from DOS attacks for free and it's very powerful. So anybody that lets their website go down from a DOS attack is just not paying attention these days. Yeah? How would the hacker uh, protect themselves from any of these types of things? Well, hackers typically can protect themselves by not having a public presence. I mean, you, you're only subject to this sort of attack if you're actually trying to run a public server. If you're just an attacker, then you're a client and they probably can't find you. But most people do want to have a server somewhere, putting on a web page or email, and then, I mean, that's the problem. Like, if you have a town, people can attack you, so now you have to have walls and moats and defenses. If you were a nomad, you wouldn't need that. And so the question is, uh, what are your assets? This is the fundamental issue. You have, if you have some assets, now you have to protect them. And so, uh, this is, uh, if you want to protect yourself against DOS attacks, there are two major techniques. One is to get filtering devices that will detect the bad packets and block them. And the other is to just have more total capacity so that you can serve up responses to all that traffic without running out of capacity. And they, you typically protect yourself with a combination of these. Cloudflare gives you both of these for free. They'll run your traffic through their network, which is very large, and it has a bunch of automated filters that will still block out most of that. But that's generally what you do. Those are good questions. All right, so uh, when you're doing a penetration test or a security audit of a bank, you typically, or any other company, you typically do not test for DOS vulnerabilities because they're very crippling if they happen and they typically don't want you testing them directly. Flooding the network or traffic is the kind of thing that typically exceeds what they want done in a test. Cloudflare does this. Cloudflare has failover where they have something like 30 data centers all over the world and Matthew Prince, the CEO of Cloudflare, says he will go and find the cable going to San Jose and just pull it in the middle of a business day while they're handling real traffic and measure to see 
does anything happen? They say if you're running pings, you lose one ping, and within one second, it all goes down to Los Angeles and stays up, and that's called a cutover test. That is what companies that are really serious about um, load balancing do. They actually turn off real servers in the day while handling real business to make sure that things work. The most extreme is Amazon. Amazon runs a service, and so does Netflix, called Chaos Monkey. And Chaos Monkey runs in the company and it breaks things randomly. It deliberately turns off servers, breaks network wires, turns off services all the time because they want everyone in the whole company to just get used to it. Whatever you design has to be able to handle failures, so we artificially create failures all the time, so you'll notice quickly if your stuff isn't fault tolerant. And at first, this sounds insane, but the end result is it does result in better infrastructure that stays up. Netflix is a real leader in high security, and they won't hire any of you. Netflix won't take any of our students as interns, and they won't take any of our graduates. They don't want to hear from you until you have five years of coding experience on the job, because they said there is no degree and no credential anywhere that trains you to write secure code. And that's what they want. The only thing that teaches people to write secure code is you go to college, you get a degree, and then you work in the real industry for five years, finding out what you really have to do, which bears only a passing resemblance to what you see in textbooks and such. That's Anyway, it would be nice if that would change someday. And Facebook is now um, just beginning to make a secure coding program, which I think is beta testing around here, um, where they actually take their internal in-house training for programmers, and now they're trying to make a class out of it where you learn to write secure code. If you go over to CS and learn to write code, they're going to do it up to modern standards, which means you're not going to learn any security, which is crazy, but that's the way it is. That's the way the textbooks and classes are. We're in the infancy of adding security to coding classes, and we really need to. Anyway, uh, DDoS is the most common type um, where you have takeover machines with malware, and now you have thousands or millions of machines all attack one target. This means it's very hard to block because the traffic is coming from all different locations and it's hard to tell that from the real traffic, from legitimate customers using your website. Uh, these things are called zombies, computers that are infected and under control of a criminal being used for some criminal purpose. Um, so buffer overflows are another kind of attack. We do, we're going to do a lot of these in the malware uh, in the exploit development class. Uh, this was the most common type of security uh, flaw until about five years ago. Now it's declining. Um, this is where you have, it's entirely due to the language C. C is a very efficient language. If you write code in C or C++ and compile it, you get very small, very fast machine code. But the problem is there's no security, there's no safety in it. It's like driving a car by reaching with a wrench and just turning the gears while you're driving. Um, it's, so if you tell C, I'm going to have 10 letters, store room for 10 letters, and then you say, put 1,000 letters in there, it just doesn't. It doesn't notice that there's a problem here or fix it. If you tell Visual C, if you tell Visual Basic to do that, Visual Basic will just allocate more room for the bigger object. But C will just start at the first one and put in 1,000 bytes, overriding whatever else should have been there, assuming you know what you're doing, never questioning your orders. And so that's a buffer overflow, where you run past the limit of a stored region of memory, and you start overwriting other memory that's being used for a different purpose. In most cases, this just causes the program to crash, and you get denial of service. If you learn how to do it very precisely, you can take over the machine now by injecting code, which then runs and give you control of the machine. Yeah? Well, yeah, you, every, yeah, every attack leaves some footprint. Uh, buffer overflows can be detected. One common way to detect them is to look for a series of NOPs. Uh, they typically have a series of 100 or 1,090 bytes. They don't have to, but that's always the most commonly done. Um, yet, in general, every attack does leave evidence, but there's not a generic kind of evidence always. But yeah, in the principle of forensics, you'll see, you'll find some evidence. You'll find network traffic coming in, you'll find other evidence left behind by it. Anyway, so uh, if you want to write secure code, you need to learn it, and there's tons and tons of these. There's buffer overflows in Solaris and Windows Server and email <coughs> products. Uh, every, every system has them, and they've been disastrous. Uh, then there's the ping of death. This was a very simple attack back in the days, in the 90s, like Windows 95. If you send a large ping to some, to, you can only send 1,500 bytes per packet over the Internet. You can send a ping that is 60,000 bytes in, in size. So it has to send a series of 40 packets, which are then reassembled at the other end by TCP sequence numbers. Remember, we talked about this last time. 
you can send maliciously generated packets that do not line up correctly when they're reassembled. There's a whole series of these. There's the land attack, which I think is the one where you make them overlap. Like this one goes from packet 4,000 to 5,500, and this one goes from packet 5,000 to 6,000, so it overlaps. And when the reassembly routine runs, it might make a mistake. The ping of death is where you send too many, so it adds up to more than 64 kilobytes at the other end. Mm -hmm. And that would overflow the buffer and crash Windows 95. So you could send one ping and kill it. It actually travels as a pl uh, maybe 50 packets. Um, and there are a whole series of variants on this. Um, this is, if you send a large ping and catch it in Wireshark, you can send a large ping from Kali, the ping minus S, 60,000. That'll send a single page, 60,000 bytes big, and you'll see it go as a whole bunch of fragmented IP packets in Wireshark. All these packets combine to make one ping. And if you then alter them so that they don't really line up right, vulnerable services will crash. And although they fixed it in Windows 95 long ago, the iPad 2 is vulnerable to this and the land attack and so are the mobile devices we're getting typically reproduce the security flaws from decades earlier. So it's kind of fun to go into Scapy, which you'll be doing in this class. You learn how to write attacks in Scapy and it's very easy to write these old attacks, like a series of packets with the wrong TCP sequence number and um, you can test them. And when I did that, a lot of modern devices are vulnerable again. Um, there's also even another fun thing. There's a terrible thing in IP version 4 called, called uh, fragmentation. The idea is there used to be something called token ring, and token ring actually moved something like 10,000 bytes in a single packet. Then Ethernet came out, and it was really popular, and it only moved 1,500 bytes in a packet. So you could have a token ring network where packets of data that are 10,000 bytes big are coming in, and you're trying to put them on an Ethernet network that can only take 1,500 bytes. So each token ring packet has to be split up into six Ethernet packets to move it forward. And the way they did that was by a layer three fragmentation. The router at the edge, at layer three, would take it upon itself to do this, breaking the packet up and reassembling it at the other end without telling the source at all. So you would not know this was happening. So you're sending data 10,000 bytes at a time. It's being delivered 1,500 bytes at a time, and you don't know that. And so you can do this down to anything you want. And there's an attack tool called Frag Router. It's in Kali. If you run Frag Router, um, which is trailing right down here someplace, a uh, frag router will break everything up into eight byte packets. So if you're sending an attack that's 100 bytes, it'll turn into like 50 packets on the wire. The point of this is it'll be slower to get there, but all the network defenses can't figure out what it is because they're only seeing little tiny pieces of it. It's like trying to detect a malicious email where you can only see like one letter at a time. You'd have to really delay the packets to stop it. So this is fragmentation. It is not possible in IP version six. IP version six did away with this process. If you are on an IP version six network, and for some reason, a router cannot forward a packet because of the packet sizes. It just contacts the source server and says, please resend it with smaller packets. So it does not have this crazy process of things being broken up and reassembled at layer three, which turned out to lead to a lot of security problems. Then there's session hijacking. We talked about last time. If you have a series of TCP packets being used for something like FTP, where someone is controlling a server and uploading a web page, you can intercept them and replace them with other packets with the same TCP sequence numbers, and the, there will be nothing there that the server can use to tell that you're the fake traffic instead of the real traffic. So I can replace the web page with a malicious web page, kicking out the real administrator. This is what you get for using unencrypted protocols. If you used HTTPS or secure FTP that's encrypted, this attack would fail because even if I can forge the sequence number, I cannot forge the, the content with the right key, so it will not accept my fraudulent data. That's why everything important should be encrypted, and we're getting there. I think I know a lot more websites that go to HTTPS than HTTP. Still quite a lot of FTP out there, though, which is a sin and a shame. FTP and Telnet should have been dead 20 years ago. It's nuts to send unencrypted confidential data over the internet, but there's a lot of it still going on. And then, of course, there's physical security. If someone can physically get their hands on your server, and for that matter, on your routers and your wires and your switches, then, of course, they can break into your network in an obvious physical way, and none of your technical solutions are stopping them. So you have to have secure physical parts of the building, like a server room and such. So that gets you down to lock picking and such. Then the really hard one is insider threats. I already mentioned this one. We're the head of the company here, the head of our technology department, our CTO, was nuts and betraying us and destroying the college. This kind of thing happens a lot, where you have an entrusted insider and they stab you in the back. It happens in the military, it happens everywhere, it happens in police departments, 
This is really bad. Uh, many people uh, agree, I went to a conference just on this topic to talk about this, and they said something like 80% of the, the damage done at companies is done by insiders. They have an opportunity. More than half the businesses in America that fail, fail because the employees steal the products too much. If you go to the drugstore, they have a camera over the section with film, they have a, uh, or films and cameras and little computer doodads, or in like a lock case, and they have a camera there. That's not to stop customers from stealing it. That's to stop employees from stealing it. <laughs> and I, uh, I used, my ex-wife was an undercover detective in San Francisco. And one of the jobs that she did, when you don't get enough jobs as an undercover detective, you can just go Batman. You go to the flea markets, and there are people there selling batteries in the pack, film in the pack. You buy some, you take a photograph, and then you send a letter to the drugstore and say, I know which of your employees is just stealing boxes of stuff from the room and selling it at the flea market, and for 500 bucks I'll tell you, and here's the evidence. And that's, you can do this if, you're not, if you want to. This happens all the time. This is why um, all the big retailers will not let you send them products just in a pallet in a truck anymore. Target won't even talk to you if you do that. Everything now has to have an RFID tag on it at every stage because there used to be a thing called falling off the truck. You'd ship a thousand boxes of film, you put it in the truck, somehow when the truck got to the next place there'd only be 990 boxes of film, then you stick them on the shelves, somehow only 980 of them end up on the shelves, every stage you lose some, and all these guys would just have all this stuff they're stealing because nobody was really counting it at every stage because it was too difficult. And now everything has to have a radio readable RFID tag. Everything that goes to the big companies like Target, they will not buy anything unless you guarantee like one million units a year and that it will all come with radio tags on it so we can easily scan at every step and make sure that if 100 went on the truck here, 100 come off the truck there. Because if you don't, people steal a little bit all the way down the chain. Yeah. Uh, boxes of film, you know, to put in cameras. Yeah, that's right, they're kind of out of date these days. Used to be popular. Yeah, that was a story from a while ago. I guess they must be selling something else at the flea market now. Are you referring to just like film that we see for our... Yeah, 35 millimeter film, yeah. Oh. That used to be a big... Any, anything that's high cost and small um, and light, easy to steal. Mm -hmm. People steal them all the time. They steal drugs out of the hospitals um, from the shipping department and everywhere else. There's. You know, any place where you have a company, there, one of the scams I was in prosecuting when I was working at the FTC under contract was a company that sold toner and paper to businesses. And they went on for three years. They would give you great deals on toner and paper. And they sold to thousands of businesses, and they just never shipped any product at all. You just never get it. And people would just order for a long time without figuring this out. It was a really simple scam, and they had 50,000 victims. And when I got the data, we were going to give money back to these victims. The FTC shut them down, kicked in the doors, impounded their money. We wanted to give the money back to the victims. But when they went in to impound the computers, one of the crooks was up there erasing the data. And he got most of the data. So I got a database that consisted of the name of the company and the street address without the city, state, and zip code. So I had like Al's office supply, one park lane, nothing more. And I spent months, and I found out you can never find an address like that. Good luck. There is no way we could never find it. We found one victim out of the 50,000 after months of searching. There's nothing you could do. So the FTC just spent their money on public service commercials and brochures saying, dude, you know, when you order something, <laughs> check to make sure it shows up. And if it doesn't, then complain, you know. You'll find brochures like that down at the police department here telling you, you know, I, I, when I go to the bank, I see signs saying, if you are coming here to get a cashier's check to send it to Nigeria, please don't. Because a bunch of people are getting emails and they think if I send $10,000 to Nigeria, someone's going to send me a bunch of gold. And the bank says, we can't really stop you, but we really wish you wouldn't do that. <laughs> anyway, um, so the San Francisco had this happen to us. This guy here, Terry Childs, was the network administrator at San Francisco. And he was a very scary man that had four armed robbery convictions from Kansas, which he did not disclose. And he, um, they, he took over the network. He intimidated and scared all the other network administrators out. He ran all the traffic through his San Francisco network through a fiber optic cable into his desk where he did something unknown to it and stored eight terabytes of data on a removable hard drive of some kind of information that he thought was valuable. Um, and he installed extra remote control devices on the network, hardware and software, and locked everybody out. And then when they tried to fire him, he wouldn't let anybody in the network. He set all the routers to self-destruct so you could not even uh, recover the password without them wiping out all the configurations using a undocumented military feature of Cisco routers. 
He was really very f advanced in knowledge of security and a very scary criminal guy. And they eventually prosecuted him. And the, the prosecutor comes and gives talks here frequently to my friendship class. He gave one last semester. Uh, this set the standard. He was the first man that ever prosecuted successfully a company administrator for hacking into his own network. Before this, that was considered impossible. But he managed to convince the jury and explain to them clearly how even if you are the network administrator, there are some things you are not allowed to do. And when you do that, you have now committed the crime of hacking against your own company, which is what this guy did. It is very common that you have insiders going nuts on you. And this guy, and the guy, yeah. Yeah. You're supposed to have a, as well as you're supposed to have a, a, a jury of, of people like you. Well, you get a jury of normal yeah. citizens, not necessarily, it depends on what you mean by people like you, but you get a jury of normal citizens. Oh, but do they ever call for any computer research? No, not at all. They don't pay attention to things like that. Uh, all they care is that they are um, like from your town and people that are like normally have a job and such. The only thing they care about is that they can't be um, like related to law enforcement officials or involved in the case somehow or biased in any way. But then they're just ordinary people. I served on a jury. In fact, when I served on a jury, I was one of three computer security guys there, and it was not a computer crime, but the judge was really freaked out that I teach this class. He totally stopped. Wait a minute. You teach a hacking class? How is this even possible? And man, that's all they wanted to hear out of me is, what am I teaching here, and does that make me crazy and a criminal and stuff? And um, and then two other members of the jury were in network security. One of them stopped spam at Facebook, and I forget what the other guy does, but they, they all knew what ethical hacking was. And the, the jury and the lawyers, the judge and the lawyers were freaked out, but the jury, we all knew it. Anyway, um, so this guy here is a, a crook that runs in Atlanta, Georgia. He runs a penny stock. He was in prison for fraud with Kevin Mitnick, and he started a security company down there. He claims to be the security uh, official for like an NFL team or something. And his idea of a pen test is he will run NMAP and then send you the NMAP results. He wrote a book called Become the World's Number One Hacker. He had a radio show where he would teach you to be the world's number one hacker in five minutes a day. And it was all completely fake and stolen material. But he started hiring real FBI agents to work for his company, ex-FBI agents. And that's when I contacted some of them and told them not to work for him. So he responded with this. He sent emails to all the administration here saying I was racist and stuff. Uh, but they didn't fire me. But you know, there's always somebody every semester screaming saying they have to fire me. And uh, these are insider attacks, people inside attacking you. These are people inside the security community stabbing each other, which happens a lot. There's also a guy that put up a fraudulent uh, ethics complaint against me to strip me of my uh, IFC squared certification with just completely false claims. And again, I, I got, I, my class helped. I was teaching the CISSB class. My class helped me write my response, and I fixed that. But if you get an IFC certification, you have to defend it just like a lawyer and a doctor, and people can make ethics complaints against you, and you have to respond, and they are considered, and you will lose your certification if they prove that you did something bad. Um, so anyway, um, if people can get physical access to your machine, they can put in a keylogger. Now, there are software keyloggers, just another form of spyware that record your key presses, but there's hardware keyloggers. We have a few up in the lab. Yeah? Did you watch this little bit? I watched a few of them. I sort of lost interest. But yeah, the, the technical part seemed pretty good. It sort of got baffling and confusing after a few episodes, and I lost interest. But the technical part is good. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, um, so you can put a, a hardware keylogger. It just plugs in line with the cable, and it stores all the key presses. And we've got them up in the lab. So it's like a USB stick. It's got some memory. Everything you type gets stored on this thing, and you can dump it out by typing in special words or special key presses at a text document. Um, this is almost impossible to detect and prevent. Their antivirus will do you no good. It has no software footprint at all. It's stealing the electric signals before they enter the computer. So there's nothing in the computer that can detect it. The, um, some companies go so far as to glue the plugs in to the keyboard to prevent this, which is one possible way. Unless you do a physical audit of the cables and look at every device, how do you know? And very often, keyboards do have a plug adapter of some kind as they plug in. So, you know, it's. You can also buy keyboards that have them built in. Here, boss, I got your new keyboard. You know, they, one of the things, they stole a teacher's final exam about six years ago at another college with this. The student stuck in one on the teacher's computer. That would totally work. Anyway, um, you can put anti-keylogger software on your machine, and that works. We had uh, one of the students put a Python keylogger on a lot of machines up in the lab. There are all these signs everywhere warning you if you've got a lot of passwords. But there's uh, anti-keylogger software that scrambles the internal signals so that it stops software keyloggers from getting the data. 
but I don't think it will stop a hardware keylogger because there's nothing in the computer that can stop it. It's stealing the pressures before they get in the computer. Anyway, um, all right. So once your servers are locked up, then people can't mess with them. Uh, if someone can get physical access to your server, they can, they're obvious attacks. They can just turn it off. There's a denial of service attack. They can steal the whole thing or the hard drive, and then they've got all the data unless you had it encrypted. Uh, and usually encrypting data on a server is not done, and it's generally considered useless because the server is running all the time, so it must have the key and be decrypting. So attacks that take over the running server over the network will not be stopped by this. The only thing encrypting the hard drive does is protect the data when the machine is turned off. And the only machine that makes sense to do that on is a laptop, where you are likely to have the whole machine stolen. Anyway, um, yeah? Yeah. Uh, on a hardware, uh, what's the password on there? You can get different ones. Typically, it's something like uh, 32 meg or something. It's basically just got a USB stick in there. So you can get cheap ones that only have like 16 megs. So you can pay 100 bucks and get USB ones that have enough to store a whole lot of data. And the only problem is you have to get physical access to the machine to install it, and you have to get physical access to get the data off. Although there are ones, like the ones they put in gas station pumps in Utah. They have about uh, 150 gas stations where someone would open up the actual gas station pump and go to the credit card reader and install a gadget that would take the credit card data and send it by Wi-Fi to a car park nearby. And then they never retrieve it. They just have to get near. And you can get key loggers that send it out by radio. So then you only need to get physical access to the machine once. There was a guy that did this at a bank about three years ago. He worked at the bank as a janitor at midnight. And he went with a his camera and took a video of him riding up the elevator, going to the CEO's office, putting the key logger in it, and then he put it on YouTube. I'm like, the cops, of course, arrested him, and they're like, dude, this keeps happening. There's people out there that think the cops can't find YouTube or something. Anyways, <laughs> anyway, uh, there's, there's a whole website of dumb criminals, you know, <laughs> people doing just, anyway, um, you can buy, you can boot the, um, any you can get you to another CD, boot it to Linux, and then read all the data off the hard drive, or you can just steal the hard drive, and only if it's encrypted would that stop them. And as you all know now, the locks we use in America are a sin and a shame. Anybody that has made even a half-hearted effort to learn how to open them can open them without the key. And even if that half-hour training we did last time is too much bother for you, you can get a bump key, which you just go tap, 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 and open it. Um, and after like five minutes of training, uh, they, opened, they had a 12-year-old girl at DEF CON open the door on the White House in 20 seconds with a bump key. That cost nine hundred dollars, um, and so it's it's lock physical locks in America are what's known as security theater, uh, like the TSA inspections, where they actually make it look like they're doing something, but they aren't really doing anything. Um, and this makes people feel better. It's like a covert subsidy of an industry. People, you can trust us because we locked in the vault. There now, people trust my bank again. Then you know. How about those yeah. fancy locks? Uh, well, These ones, different. yeah. Well, some of them are actually hard to pick, and if you go to it's like the links at the end of that lockpicking project, there's some people, and we'll have a guy giving talk about lockpicking in a couple of weeks here, Jimmy Dolan, who really is an expert. There are some locks that are really hard to pick, and you could buy them, and they don't even necessarily cost much more. So, in, just like everything in the world of security, there ought to be a security rating on those locks. Mm -hmm. We ought to have a test, and it ought, if you go to Home Depot and get the locks that I hashed out in class, they ought to mark those one, very low security, and you ought to be able to label this is a two or a three. This has got to be coming. What's happened, this is like back in the old days when they don't bother to tell you what's in the food, so you don't know if it's full of like preservatives or something. We've got to start marking products with how secure they are, so people know what they're buying. But we're not there yet, and we're not likely to get there anytime soon. It will require an act of Congress, and our government is paralyzed. Anyway, um, these things are very good, these magnetic locks. Um, at least they can be better, where you have a card. Now, some of them, quite a few of them, in fact, in the first generation, were in fact very insecure and easy to defeat like the BART tickets and stuff. Um, there's a, that was another DEF CON scandal. An MIT team run by um, Ron Rivest, I think, who is the guy, the R at RSA, they hacked the Boston subway, they, which runs on the same system BART does, which is the most common thing called MyFair. This is the main, most popular company that sells you little magnetic cards that you can run through things. And it turns out that they were easily tricked. They were easily able to make a card and you add free money to the subway and make you look like somebody else. And they, um, 
totally hacked the Boston system and found like four or five vulnerabilities, and then they were, again, blocked from giving the talk by the FBI as the company sued and said, you can't give that talk. So it was about a year before the talk came out. But anyway, so these things are not necessarily all that secure either, but they do have the advantage that you know who went in the room and you know when they went in the room because everybody's card is different. So you have a log, and that's a really good idea. What's even better is to have security cameras watching the room so you know who went in there and who was doing the bad thing. Um, all right, those are good. And I got the last batch of eye clickers, and then I'll go up to the lab and help anybody that wants help on the project. All right, so. Well, encoding goes six bits at a time. All right, I'll quit at 30. And that's um, base 64. The six bits have a total of 64 combinations. It's two times two times two times two times two times two. So you need 64 characters to encode it. All right. Uh, all right. What measure watches all network traffic detecting a tracks? Is Uh, that's IDSs, intrusion detection systems. The most common free one is Snort, and there are a whole bunch of commercial ones. Um, it's antivirus for a network. All right. And uh, so what's the hazard that catches passwords even when you're using a secure connection? key logger, steals the key presses before they get encrypted. All right. And which one of these gives you physical security? I'll quit at 25. Looks like the answers are in. That's, of course, the card reader lock or any kind of lock. Even the locks I'm mocking give you some degree of physical security. Remember, nothing's ever perfect. There are some attackers that can't even pick that lock you get at Home Depot, so it does lower the number of criminals getting through there. It's just not as low as people think it is. But that's true of most security measures. Most security measures only stop amateurs, and the pros are aware of how to get past them. All right. So if you turn off the electrical power, what's happening? That's denial of service. It's a simple kind. It means that means it doesn't do any good. And this is common in the military. You know, if you can't attack the troops directly, you can attack their power or their supply lines or their food, and the end result is the same. They can't keep fighting anymore until they solve that problem. All right. What's that part? That's fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And it's the technique of lying to people to make them scared so they will buy your fake junk. Oh. 